I have been so thrilled about preparing and getting ready to come to Flavor tonight because there's just something exciting about when we gather together. And, I, you know, it doesn't matter really what the topic is. It's just what it, whenever you open God's Word and you're with a bunch of beautiful girlfriends and, and sisters, something great always happens. And I'm confident that that's going to be the way it is tonight as we kick off Love Handles. Now, for those of you who are fitness enthusiasts, no insults are intended. We are not talking about love handles. No. I want to explain this. You've seen in some of the ads that we've had in flyers that we've been passing around a photograph, and I think we have it for the side screen or up here, yes. Some of you don't realize, but that was me in 1971. <laughs> Haven't changed a bit, have I? <laughs> 1971, just leave it up there, because this was Christmas, and that was Christmas morning of 1971, and as you look at this picture, I want you to understand that before this time ever happened, around October, something huge and monumental happened in our home. That's when the Sears and Roebuck catalog <laughs> came to our mailbox. Now, for the younger generation, just like these other people didn't know about Taylor Lautner, the Sears and Roebuck catalog was like Walmart.com or Super Target or, gosh, I, I, mean, I don't know if it was as cool as Forever 21, but it was a try to be because you know Sears, they sell washing machines, they sell um, tools, they sell um, furniture, they sell bedding, but they sell toys. They used to. I know Sears has been reinvented, but back, 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 back in 1971, when that catalog came to your home, the pages quickly became worn out. Because it was basically a Google search, but on paper. And you just flipped through and looked. And I spotted that bicycle on the pages of the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And I turned the edge of that page down, I put that on my list for Santa, AKA I showed it to my mom and dad too, just to be safe. <laughs> and I just knew that someday I might could, possibly could have a bicycle as cool as that. It was called a Stingray. Had a banana seat, a banana seat. That's none of this little stuff. It's a huge one. Now, <laughs> I would take total offense to that now because that might mean that I needed such a large seat. But back in the day, it had this huge seat and these giant handlebars, which now we call chopper bars, but they were just stingray handlebars. Well, around November, our family would take a trip to the actual Sears and Roebuck store. And we would go to the store, my dad would head off in his direction, but my mom would have my sister and I, and we would just go take a peek at some of those things we had seen in that catalog. And I remember when my eyes first hit that bike. I even took it down off the shelf and kind of tried to ride it on the, the little linoleum floor, but the salesman wasn't real happy with that, so we quickly had to put it back, and, and I just got to touch it. But on that Christmas morning, when that bike came, well, I mean, the photo itself explains it all. I was in just heaven. It was like, the bike is here, and I got to ride it. And let me tell you something. You can take the picture down now. Let me tell you something. When I grabbed hold of those handlebars, now, the go-go boots had nothing to do with the bike. I just, <laughs> I don't know what year Nancy Sinatra's song, These Boots Are Made For Walking, came out. You need to Google that. Nancy Sinatra, these boots are made for walking, and that's just what I'll do. And one of these days, these boots are going to walk all over you. That's kind of how it went, you know? The boots have nothing to do with the bike. <laughs> but when I grabbed hold of those handlebars, my life changed because I had freedom. I rode that bike. We lived in Columbia, South Carolina. They had just put sidewalks in on our street, and I rode that bike everywhere everywhere. I mean, truly, places my mom probably doesn't realize that I went. 
because I went to see friends. I would go anywhere I possibly could. I loved that bicycle. Now, I just used a word. I said, I loved that bicycle. I loved that bicycle because I grabbed hold of the handles and it allowed me to experience something great. It was a gift. God's love is a gift to you and me. It's an amazing gift. It's a gift that, that he gave to us so that he could have a relationship with us. And yet, as I just used the term love to describe my feelings for that bicycle, haven't I just kind of like sapped the energy and the meaning and the power out of the word? God loves us. And if we, as every woman in this room and in our different environments, could grab hold of the handles of how magnificent, how powerful, how extraordinary, how unbelievable God's love is, and give it the potency and power that it deserves, that, it, it, that it's talked about in Scripture, over 600 times in God's Word, the word love or a form of the word love is used. It's a major theme in Scripture. In fact, the Bible says that God is love. That is 1 John 4, 16. God is love. I'm going to give you tonight just a couple of facts about what the Bible says about love because it says a lot about love. But if the Bible says that God is love, then we better not be decaffeinating the word. I drink decaffeinated coffee on occasion, and I remember somebody telling me, well, do you know how coffee becomes decaffeinated? They use a chemical, and they soak it in this chemical, and they wash away the caffeine, and, and then they take it out, and they distill it, and then they put the moisture back in the bean, but without the caffeine, so that you can drink it without the little extra, you know, kind of what my husband has every weekend. <laughs> Actually, every day, you just get to see it on the weekend. <laughs> We take God's love and we wash away the power that comes with it. And in our culture today, we talk about things that we love. We might say, I love that bicycle. We might say, wow, that vacation spot we went to, we just loved that place. We talk about different things that we experience and we say, we loved it. Oh, I love that movie. And that's a natural thing. I think that makes, makes it an adverb. I'm not sure, I'm not that great with English, but. We talk about it in such a way that it just becomes a normal thing. And yet, 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. We ended that little repertoire of great music with the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. If the Beatles really knew that God is love, then they were absolutely spot on with that song. All you need is love, because all you need is God. I'm doubting that they really knew that when they wrote the song. It's way more than a decaffeinated version of the word love. So tonight, I want us to grab hold of, get handles on the depth and the breadth and the magnitude of God's love. In this series, Love Handles, we're gonna be talking about three different dimensions of God's love. One is how much God loves you and me. That's tonight. Then we're gonna talk about how we express our love to God. And then the third installment will be how we take the love of God that he has so graciously and abundantly poured into our lives and bring it before a world that is so in need of love. And you see, they build upon one another. How can we express love to God if we don't fully understand the magnitude of how much he loves us? How can we show love to others if we're not, not only understanding how much God loves us, but if we're not expressing love to God? I can't really love another human being if I don't first love God. That's radical, but it's truth. It's in God's word. We're gonna unpack these different truths, and tonight I just want us to grab hold of how much God loves us. So I'm going to just give you a couple statements. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. And I've already given you one. God is love. Say it with me. God is love. God is love. From the beginning of time, before 
the oceans were even spilled onto the earth before the continents were formed, before the birds of the air and the fish of the sea were created, or man, God was love. Just as God is holy, God is love. It's a character quality of God. It's the very fiber of his being. God is a perfect God. He is love. His love is a perfect love. Unbelievable. It's a perfect love. Here's another statement for you. God's love is more than we can ever imagine. Ephesians 3, verse 17 through 19 says, Then Christ will, will make his home in our hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down in God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand. This is what we need to pray for, the power to understand. As all of God's people should. In other words, this is something that all of us need to grab hold of. As all of God's people should, how wide how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. In other words, when we grab hold of how much God loves us, and it's through Jesus Christ that he shows his love and demonstrates his love, because remember, he's a perfect God with perfect love, and we're imperfect people, but when we understand how deep, how wide, how far his love reaches, then we go, wow, it's an aha moment. Again, his love is not decaffeinated. It's not powerless, it's powerful. In fact, the last part of that verse says that we will experience the fullness of life and understand the power of God when we grab hold of how much he loves us. Here's another statement. God's love is everlasting. It has no beginning and it has no end. Jeremiah 31.3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, no beginning or no end, and I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Even in our imperfect state, God, with his perfect love, is drawing us in. He's drawing you in. He's drawing me in. Now, I know that there's some in this room tonight, me included. When I consider the things that I've done before a holy God, I know I don't deserve that love. I don't. And we can measure the, the differences of what one person has done versus the other, but you know what? Sin is sin. And so there's not one person who came into this room tonight who is a little less clean than the other because in God's eyes, sin is sin. But his love, that perfect love, still draws, still pulls from the beginning to the end. From, there is no beginning because he was loved from the very beginning, and there is no end. It, the magnitude is everlasting. Here's another statement. God's love changes who we are. When we receive that love that he's drawing us to, when we receive that love that is Jesus Christ, it changes who we are. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Lavished. I love that word. I mean, it's just like a word that means more than I could ever even dream of. Don't you like that feeling like you, you think something's great and then you just get way more? That's what God's love is. You think you just need a little bit, and he just says, Wait a minute, I've got so much more where that came from. It's an abundant love. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. It changes who we are. We go from being orphans to children of God. Now that's something that's just supernatural, but it comes because God loved you and I so much. I didn't even put in my notes John 3.16. But you know what? It starts there. For God so loved the world, you and me are the world. We are the world. Google that one, too. <laughs> These girls are going to be on the computer all night. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. His only son. 
There was a sacrifice made so that he could have a relationship with us. The perfect God, the perfect love, came down the staircase of heaven with a baby in his arms and said, this is a sacrifice so that I can have a relationship with you. You see how great God's love is? It's a caffeinated love. It's a powerful love. It's a love that when you receive it and accept it, it changes who you are because you become a child of God. We have to get a handle on this. We have to know the length and the breadth and the depth of God's love. There's a story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. Now, it's a lot of scripture, and I'm going to paraphrase some of it but I want to challenge you to read this passage because it's called a parable. A parable is a story that was told, and we don't know whether Jesus was telling a story that had actually happened and he was referring to it, or if he said this is what possibly could have happened, it's, it's, he's making up a scenario. But either way, it's Jesus' words, and when Jesus told a story, it always had a purpose. Not a word was uttered from his mouth that did, that did not make a difference. So when he uttered this, this story, he talked about the greatness of God's love. It's the story of the prodigal son, of the son that was lost. Now the story goes like this in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. It says, there was a man, and this man was a very wealthy man, and he had two sons. And his sons, you know, worked the fields and were a part of his home, but they lived in the blessed spot of this estate. But one of the sons decided that he wanted to leave. He just said, you know what? I want my inheritance. I want to go my own way. I'm tired of this life that I'm living here with you. I have a relationship. I have a family. I have a home. I have great wealth because it was all available to him through his family. I have security but I want to go my own way. So the son decided to ask the father for his inheritance. And the father said, okay. And he divided up the inheritance, gave the son his money, and off the son went. He left the security. He left the boundaries. He left the presence of his father. And off he went. Now, it says that he went to a far away land, a distant land. That word distant is so important. He was a long way from the presence of his father. He used his money to enjoy life, but there came a famine in the land. Somehow in the scripture, there's this theme that goes throughout the Old Testament to the New Testament, and things get really rocky when there's a famine in the land. And this son, who had plenty of wealth, squandered it on all of his party lifestyle. He squandered it on his, you know, perhaps addictions. He squandered it on women. He squandered the resources and the blessings that his father had bestowed upon him. And he found himself in the midst of a famine, feeding pigs. Now, you have to understand, he got a job. And the guy said, who was the uh, employer, said, you need to go to the field and feed the pigs. Now, for a Jew, this was disgusting. It was absolutely the lowest form of work that he could possibly have. Because to a Jew, a pig, swine, was unclean. And yet, this guy was in such a depraved state that he said, I'll take the job. And his job was to feed the pigs. Now see the picture here? He's left the presence of his father. He's gone to a distant land. And he's now feeding pigs. And as he's feeding the pigs, something just dawns on him. It says, he came to his senses. I'm sure there was a pit in his stomach because he was so hungry. In fact, the, the um, scripture, the, this reference here says that he wanted to even eat the food that the pigs were eating. He was so hungry in this distant land. And he came to his senses. 
Our senses are touch, feel, smell, sight. I'm sure he looked around and thought, what in the world have I done? I've gone from the blessed place, from the home that's in a state with plenty, to a literal pigsty. I'm sure he smelled the feces. I'm just being real here the rotten food that was being fed to the pigs, and yet he was so hungry, he might could taste in his mind the food back at his home, but all he knew was the food that was right there in front of him. He came to his senses, and he felt far, far away. When he came to his senses, he went back, retraced his steps, walked back home. And I love the last part of this section of Scripture. It says in verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. He got up and went to his father. He made a move. He didn't stay there and go, oh, woe is me. I remember back in the day. I remember what I had back then. No, he got up and went to his father. He got up and went to the presence of his father. He made a move. And in verse 20, it says this, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Can't you just imagine that he still smelled a little bit like pig? (laughs) That he probably was covered in dirt. The fine clothes that he had, he'd probably sold. He only had one change of clothes, most likely. And now they were covered in dirt. But the father saw him from afar, had compassion, and ran to him. Did the father ever leave the presence of the son? No, the father stayed where he was, but the son chose to leave the presence of the father. And it always, always, always leads to destruction. But he came to his senses and came back. And when he walked that road, And when his father saw him, it was his father who once again initiated love. You see, compassion is not real until something happens. And the compassion of the father was demonstrated because, first of all, he threw his arms around him and touched him. He kissed him. And then he said, you know what, we're going to throw a party because my son who was lost is now home. My son who went to a distant land is now in my presence. And he said he would kill the fatted calf and celebrate. There was a sacrifice made. The father made a sacrifice on the son's behalf. God made a sacrifice for you and me so that no matter how far away we may travel from the presence of our Heavenly Father, we can still come home. We can still experience the power and the magnitude and the breadth and the depth of His love. It says in Romans 8, 38 through 39, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future or any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That ought to make you happy. It makes my heart tremble to know that God loves us that much. One day I decided to take a risk. Lee Beth was in an extracurricular activity. She was about 12 years old. EJ was maybe, I guess, five, and the twins were just about two years of age. And I took a friend's child as well. So I had EJ, Laurie Landra, and then a little girl named Emily. Emily was four months younger than Laurie and Landra. The big risk is this. Not that I had them in my home, but that I took them to Target. (laughs) Huge risk. And so I remember we got in the car, and it it was when they had just come out with those double seats, and then you had the cart, and then you could put like two people in a seat, and then you had the place where somebody else could sit. Well, EJ wasn't going to have a seat this time because I had Laurie, Landra, and then Emily in in the buggy. 
and EJ was just holding my hand, and it was going to be just a quick trip, very quick trip. In fact, NASCAR-type trip. We were going to race through Target. <clears throat> and so we went through Target. I picked up the things I needed, and they were spectacular. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is a piece of cake. This is incredible. I mean, this is so wonderful. But when we got to the register, registers are cursed. <laughs> Stores put things at registers that children just cannot live without and mothers cannot stand. And so as we got to the register, there were so many enticing things. Well, the cool thing is Laurie, Landry, and Emily were belted in. Ha <laughs> ha! So good. Such a wonderful invention. But EJ was not. And as I went to pay, I turned around and he was gone. I freaked out. I just panicked. And I'm not a panicky person. I'm a calm in the midst of a storm. But I was not calm at this moment because I've watched every movie there is about children who are missing in stores, and I just thought, it cannot happen. This will not happen. And so I abandoned the three that were in the cart. <laughs> I'm figuring this girl at the checkout, surely she can handle three kids strapped into a cart. And I looked at her, I said, my son, my son's not here. Can, can you call him on the, on the loudspeaker? And she goes, well, I'll have to get a manager and see. And I'm like, lock the door. Somebody could be headed out with my son. I mean, I'm telling you, I'd watched every movie there was. And so immediately I'm going, EJ, EJ, and I'm trying to be cool. I'm trying not to be like a frantic mom who's yelling their child's name at the front of the store. And then I decided, you know what? Cool is overrated. Let's just yell the boy's name. So I stepped back into the aisle where we had just come, and I'm like, EJ, EJ, nothing. And then I'm like, EJ, and out popped this little blonde head. He was actually in the Power Ranger underwear section. <laughs> he is absolutely going to kill me for telling y'all that. <laughs> you know? And I looked at him and I grabbed hold of him because the thought of being separated from him just freaked me out. Those of you who are moms, you know, you know, how much more does the Heavenly Father love you and me? Don't decaffeinate it. Don't water it down. When, it, when the Bible says God is love, it means God is love. And he loved us so much that he gave his only son to have a relationship with us. So mo no matter how far you might be, no matter how distracted you may be by life's gadgets and toys, he's waiting to call you back, to draw you in to kiss you and welcome you home and say, my love is here for you. My love is here for you. Bow your heads with me. God, thank you so much for being so generous with us as your children. And Father, right now, I just pray, I know that in a room this size and in our various environments, there are people who are hearing my voice and that have heard your word spoken who do not have a relationship with you. They haven't experienced firsthand your love. They haven't grabbed those handles of love that you've so freely, lavishly upon them. I pray tonight, Lord, that that would be the night that they would come from the distant land and grab hold of your love. If that's you, just pray this prayer with me. It's a very simple prayer that I prayed many years ago, but it's a prayer that will change your life forever because God's love changes us forever. You will become a son or daughter of the Most High God. You just say, God, I, I, I come before you right now, and I know that I've made mistakes. I've fouled up. I've messed up. I've, I've gone my own way. I've been distracted by so many different things, but I want to give you my heart. I know that you secured it through Jesus Christ as he died on the cross to forgive me of all of my sins. And I just received that. I received the love that you've so lavishly poured onto my life. And I want to become your daughter. Just say that prayer silently. And you know what? You have now become a daughter of the King. Others here are in a distant land. They have experience the love of God. They know what it's like to be in the hallow of his hand and in his presence, but they've come, gone so far from his presence. Come home. Just come home.
God's waiting and he wants to receive you. He doesn't want your life to be decaffeinated. He wants your life to be powerful through his love. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.